Hello, readers and writers. Welcome to lesson 30 of your ELA School Away From School. I'm Mr. Driver, and I'll be your virtual teacher for today's daily lesson. Let's start with some guiding questions. What journey does food take before it gets to your plate? How do we make decisions about what we eat? Remember that we will be addressing these questions through all of our hard work together. Time to get out some materials for today's lesson. You're going to need a copy of the text, Locavores and the Local Food Movement, your copy of lesson number 30, the lesson number 30 note catcher, as well as a pencil. Go ahead and pause the video here and make sure you have all your materials needed for today. We have two learning targets for today's work. I can determine the central idea of an informational text, and I can cite text-based evidence that provides the strongest support for my analysis of the text. Remember, the central message is a big idea that the author wants you to understand and take away from reading a text. Let's make sure we keep this learning target in mind during all of our work today. First, we'll do a close read on our article, Locavores and the Local Food Movement. As I read aloud the article, please follow along with your eyes on the words that are being spoken. Take a moment to get your article out. It is important to hear the article read in its entirety. Before we start to examine it section by section, feel free to pause the video or replay it as needed. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Locavores and the local food movement. Shopping at a farmer's market is one way that some people purchase local food. Locavores are people who aim to eat locally. In other words, locavores eat foods grown or produced as close to their home community as possible. In the past century, changes in the farming practices, food production, and consumption have resulted in a shift away from the idea of eating locally grown food. The locavore movement is based on a shift back to eating locally grown foods for both their nutritional and environmental benefits. Family farm to industrial production. In 1933, the United States government passed the Agricultural Adjustment Act. The act marked the beginnings of the local food movement. The government policy was created to help farmers survive during the Great Depression from 1929 to 1941. During that time in U.S. history, the economy was poor and parts of the country were experiencing a severe drought. The bad economy and poor farming conditions made it difficult or impossible for farmers to earn a living growing crops. Farmers were given financial help in the form of government subsidies or guaranteed prices for their crops to help them stay in business. A subsidy is money the government pays to certain businesses so that they can keep prices low. Eventually, the economy recovered. Farm subsidies that had allowed farmers to purchase cheap foods for livestock led to cheaper meats. The fast food industry was born. Equipment was invented that let farmers plant and harvest more quickly. This helped farmers meet the growing need for cheaper foods and food ingredients. More people started to want seasonal foods all year long. Food production became dependent on pesticides and other chemicals to maximize harvest. Chemical preservatives have been used to lengthen the time food stayed fresh. Fossil fuels, power, fossil fuels power farm equipment and vehicles used to transport the food around the globe. La larger farms began to put small farms out of business between the 1950s and 1970s. This is because the larger farms could produce food faster and cheaper. The United States also imported foods from other countries that had traditionally been grown here. The imported foods in turn cost less. That trend continued, and by 2004, more foods were imported than exported. A shift in food thinking. Consumers have begun to notice the negative effects of the industrial food production system. Those negative effects include health concerns caused by additives and chemicals used in food processing. Another is envi environmental costs from poor farming practices. A third negative effect is pollution and natural resource depletion from the use of fossil fuels. Over time, a movement started to encourage people to buy locally grown produce. For some, this has meant a return to smaller family owned farms. Other people go to farmers markets or grocers who sell local fruits and vegetables. Some people get food from gardens in their own yards. Locavores are concerned about the effects of moving food from farms to production facilities to customers. Transporting foods long distances causes more pollution. 
A food shed is defined as the land area that can produce the food for a certain population of people. A food shed of approximately 100 miles is usually considered to be local. Local food sheds can produce fresher foods because they are transported shorter distances. Getting this food from the farm to the consumer uses fewer non-renewable resources. This means these products have less of an environmental impact. Using a food shed. In a local food shed, much of the food is delivered directly from the farm to the consumer. People can buy the farm fresh goods at a local farmer's market. They can also join a community supported agriculture, CSA, program. In CSA programs, boxes of seasonal produce are regularly delivered to the customer's home or a common pickup location. Another means of moving foods within a food shed are through you pick programs. In these programs, Farmers invite people directly onto their farm to harvest their own fruits and vegetables. The farm to school movement. The farm to school movement encourages growing and eating local food while also teaching children how to make healthy food choices. At least 40,000 schools have started programs in which school children work with local farmers, ranchers, or fishermen. In other programs, students plan and operate their own school garden. Many of these programs also connect schools with local farms who may help provide healthy school meals. A sustainable food system. The local food movement promotes a sustainable food system. The idea is to use local food sheds and to promote food justice. Food justice means making sure all people can access fresh, healthy, affordable food. The idea is also to support the workers who grow, process, and deliver the food. This system has its challenges in a world where large populations of people live in urban areas without access to a food shed that can produce enough food. Many creative solutions to the challenges have been explored. Cities have adopted programs to convert vacant lots or deserted neighborhood areas into community-run gardens. Rooftop gardens on high-rise buildings and vertical wall gardens produce food and provide other environmental benefits. The benefits include water conservation, energy efficiency, and beautification. Some people who live in cities have greenhouses in their backyards, decks, and patios. The local food movement attempts to return to the more sustainable food system of the past where maximum use is made of the local food shed. This system used agricultural techniques that can be sustained for years to come. Now that we've had a chance to read the text together, I want you to think about a few questions. What is this article mainly about? What extra information does the title, subheadings, and pictures give you? What was the most important piece of information you read? Go ahead and pause the video here as you think about each of these questions. Now it's time to have a discussion with your family member, caregiver, or a friend. Remember, the central message is a big idea that the author wants you to understand and take away from reading a text. What do you think the central message of this article is? What details from the text make you think that? What new information did you learn? Go ahead and pause the video here while you discuss these questions. Please take out your lesson number 30 note catcher. Using the lesson number 30 note catcher, write down the central idea of the text. Use at least two details or evidence from the text to support your initial response. And remember, when we find the central idea of a text, a lot of times you want to reread the title and the subtitles or headings from each paragraph or section. Also, read the first paragraph and the last paragraph because often you will find a central main idea sentence or thesis sentence that sometimes kind of either talks about or uh, summarizes it from at the end of the article. Once you have reread these, think about your initial response, think about how that connects to it, and then write down a sentence or two that might explain more of the central message of, central idea of the article. See if you can back it up with at least two pieces of evidence, which would be taking something directly from the text, put it in quotations to back it up. Go ahead and pause the video here while you complete this work. Time to wrap up today's lesson. Let's think about how you did with today's learning targets. 
I can determine the central idea of an informational text, and I can cite text-based evidence that provides the strongest support for my analysis of a text. As a closing, share your writing with someone and tell them why you chose to write what you did. Also, remember to read a book today for 20 minutes. You can also read with a family member, caregiver, or friend. I also want you to practice your fluency by reading the article from today for one minute. You can use a timer or have someone count to 60. After one minute, count the words you read and write the number at the top of your text. Later in the week, we will do this again to see how much you've improved. Thank you again for learning with me today. Tomorrow for lesson number 31, we will dive deeper into the first half of this week's article. To better understand it, have a great rest of your day.